story, I want to welcome Michael Bosacu. He is a global affairs analyst and a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. He joins us at Vice Guard from London. Good to see you, Michael. Good to see you again, too, uh, London. Uh, London. <laughs> so there was a great deal of negotiation uh, over the past few weeks and months for this to take place, for, for Germany to make its announcement to send in tanks into Ukraine in conjunction with the U.S. coming to terms and making this agreement. What should we make of this? Well, of course, um, the news is great news for, for Mr. Zelensky, for the Ukrainian population, which has been suffering terribly and continues to do so. It's actually getting worse for a lot of them. But my worry, and I may sound like a little bit of a broken record here because I've been saying it for quite, for quite some time, is that these gaps in decision making actually give the Kremlin a huge opportunity to regroup, to dig new trenches, to think of new tactics. And um, I think Natasha and Nick nailed it perfectly in terms of portraying the amount of time that it's going to take to get these tanks on the ground and operational. Um, look, uh, as Nick said, uh, a large uh, number of Ukrainian soldiers are going to have to be taken away from the front line and trained in the use of these vehicles. In my discussions with uh, the soldiers traveling on trains, for example, they're getting very little breaks as it is. Their lines are stretched quite thinly. So I don't know how much uh, capability that will remove from Ukraine's fighting power on the front line, but it, it, it should be a concern. And, and you wrote about um, what this could mean for the war in terms of retaliation. Uh, Nick mentioned uh, the yeah. fears of a spring offensive. Uh, and Russia has already said this could heighten the war. Yeah, and you know, Linda, it's so sad because I think uh, about 10 days ago when that deadly strike happened on Dnipro with a missile designed to sink an aircraft carrier, uh, I mean, that showed us clearly that there are red lines left in terms of uh, Russia's approach to this war. Um, as soon as we think we've seen the worst of Russian behavior, they commit more mass atrocities. And knowing what we do of the Russian playbook elsewhere, for example, in Syria, I think there'll be more of a, sad to say, is kind of scorched earth policy towards civilian populations. Look, I just left Ukraine two days ago, and on the way out, I did notice quite a flow of Ukrainians from the east to other cities and also uh, to places like Europe. And that's another fear is that even if the Russians don't strike with their full force, that the anxieties, especially as the one year anniversary comes up, this will trigger more mass flow of people uh, uh, westwards. A big picture, if you will, uh, what do these mm -hmm. tanks mean for the battle on the front lines uh, once they are operational in the coming months? And how much more air defense help is needed? Sure. Well, uh, look, I mean, the, the two things Ukrainians have been begging for is air cover as well as the battle tanks. So according to my kind of cafeteria napkin calculation, uh, the Ukrainians are asking between 300 and 400. Right now, publicly, we have commitments between the UK, uh, the Europeans and the US of about 100 tanks. So it's still quite a ways to go. I know, for example, in my own country of Canada, uh, we, we have those Leopard 2 tanks, but they're either in storage or they haven't been used for a long time. It will take a while to get those. And these are heavy tanks as well. But I think what the Ukrainians also want, aside from better fighting capability on the front lines, those invincible fighting machines that the Challenger 2 and the Leopard 2 and the Abrams represent is the ability to more uh, tightly close their skies. Because as you well know, those targeted strikes on um, Ukrainian infrastructure, uh, Ukrainian power stations has been devastating, not only for day-to-day -day life, but for the Ukrainian economy in general. So one last thing, if I may, I also think there's a bit of ways to go in terms of tightening sanctions against Russia. There's still a lot of countries that, for example, allow Russians to travel, invest, and so on. Um, more, more targeted action uh, for the few friends left for Russia, like Iran and North Korea as well. And Michael, you write about the incremental gains uh, for both Ukraine and Russia over the last few months, uh, particularly uh, the battle for Solidaire, that town in Bakhmut, which yeah. uh, Ukraine has uh, been reluctant to say is, is in the hands of Russia. If it is, that is the first success for, for Russia, really, a major success since, since July last year. What does that setback indicate? Well, first of all, I think for Russia, it's much more of an achievement, Solidar, for 
PR propaganda purposes than for strategic purposes. Uh, we're, we're, don't, we're not convinced, for example, that it will provide them with an easy street to Bakhmut. Um, for the Ukrainians, um, I, I think what happened there is they calculated that, you know, unlike the Russians who were prepared to send soldiers uh, in incredible numbers into a meat grounder situation, the Ukrainians do care about human life and they do pull back when they need to. But I don't think it's uh, seen as a huge loss uh, for Ukrainians. They're still performing magnificently. But, and there are a lot of buts in this, a story with a lot of moving pieces, is that I am worried about um, the fatigue that comes in with uh, the Ukrainian soldiers at the front line for so long. And also, you know, there are, the Ukrainians don't talk about it very often, but there are losses on the Ukrainian side. I think one official said as many as 100 a day or so, com multiply that by plus 300, and that is a lot. Um, a religious leader um, recently told me that, um, quote, our priests know what the losses are because they're the ones who have to officiate over these burials. So. The longer, of course, the war goes on, the bigger toll on, on the nation in terms of human lives and cost to the economy. And we are, of course, approaching that one year anniversary since this yes. invasion began. Michael Bosikiu, good to have you as always. Thanks so much for joining us.